Hello 3D printing friends! Today on the BB3D channel we're going to take a look at the Artillery Sidewinder X1 3D printer. Stick around and we'll get into it right after this. I'm Brian and you are watching BV3D. Hi, welcome back. Hey, if you're new here and you're wanting to learn about cool 3D printer upgrades, 3D modeling, and other 3D printing related stuff, start now by subscribing and clicking the bell so you don't miss anything. Okay, so today we're going to be going over the Artillery Sidewinder X1 3D printer. A couple of months ago, Artillery asked me if I'd like to take a look at the Sidewinder X1, and I know it's been around for a little while, but it's got a couple of features that are new to me, and so I wanted to give it a try. Now, I received this direct from Artillery at no cost, and around the same time, Jim at the Edge of Tech got one from Banggood, so he and I talked and we thought it'd be fun if we did a simultaneous live stream where we could hang out and chat, build the printers, and print the sample file that came with the printer. And so we did that and it was a lot of fun. This is one of those four bolts and done kind of printers where the X and Z axis is already assembled and you just bolt it to the base and plug in the wires and you're just about ready to print. Now if you'd like to watch that, there's a card right up here that'll take you to that video. But if you don't want to go back and watch the live stream, I completely understand. I like watching live streams best when they're live because I enjoy interacting and chat. Now, Jim and I took our time putting the printers together, but if I hadn't been building it on a stream, assembly probably would have taken about 15 minutes and that's getting everything out of the box and bolted together and plugged in. So, besides the printer, what comes in the box? Well, accessory-wise, the printer comes with a set of hex keys, although they're not the ball-in type. It comes with a nice 8mm and 10mm wrench. It comes with a USB cable and a power cord. It also comes with a USB flash drive instead of an SD card or a micro SD card. The flash drive contains PDF versions of the manuals, sample G-code file to print, and a copy of the Repetier host slicing software for Windows. And there are spare parts too. There are a couple of V-slot wheels, a spare nozzle, and a spare RGB LED module. There's also a set of spare flex cables, and all of that stuff comes in a nice zipper pouch with the artillery logo. One notable omission from the tools, though, flush cutters were not included. Now, I've got a lot of printers, and pretty much all of them have included flush cutters. So it seems odd when I don't get them with a printer. They're super handy for cutting a point on the end of filament, or for cutting through zip ties. As for documentation, there's a variety of paper that comes with the printer. There's a Read Me First document with some handy safety warnings to let you know of the various ways the printer can try to maim or kill you. There's a quality checklist in Chinese and English with a 17-point inspection process, and each step has been checked off. There's a clearly illustrated installation manual in English, and for some reason there's that same information on a separate document in German. There's a sheet that shows you the correct way to connect the flex cables, complete with color close-up photos. There's a document showing you how to set up a printer profile for the X1 in the Repetier Host slicing software, and you can use that information to set this up in pretty much any slicer. And lastly, there's a little thank you card with QR codes on the back to take you to their warranty info or their customer support page or their Facebook group. So as I mentioned, assembly is easy and the instructions are pretty clear on the process. In fact, step one in the installation manual is bolt the top of the printer to the bottom of the printer, and step two is bolt the spool holder to the top of the printer. The next few steps cover plugging in the cables and adjusting the eccentric nuts on the V-slot wheels if you need to. All told, there are nine steps in the installation manual, and step nine is a quick overview of leveling the bed using the assisted leveling feature in the firmware. Okay, so having talked about the assembly process, let's talk about what you end up with once it's assembled. In other words, let's talk specs. The frame is made of V-slot aluminum extrusions and sheet metal. It feels sturdy, although I notice that the large sheet metal panel on the bottom has a little bit of give to it when I pick up the printer. The Sidewinder X1's overall dimensions are 405 millimeters wide, 550 millimeters deep, and 640 millimeters tall. Actually, it's 870 millimeters tall if you include the spool holder and a spool of filament. Its build volume is 300 by 300 by 400. It has a Titan-style direct drive extruder, meaning it's got a 3 to 1 gearing ratio to give it a bit of a mechanical advantage when pushing 1.75 millimeter filament into the Volcano-style hot end. That hot end can reach a maximum temperature of 270 degrees C, 
and it comes standard with the 0.4 millimeter nozzle. But the hot end has a PTFE liner, so exceeding temperatures of about 240 degrees C could damage that liner and possibly also release fumes which could damage you. For cooling the heat brake on the hot end, it has a 4010 fan attached to a heat sink, and for parts cooling it has a 4020 blower. Now as long as we're talking about the parts that get hot, the heater on the Ultrabase style glass bed is powered by AC line voltage, and we'll talk more about that in just a bit. Huh, I just realized something. Between the Titan style extruder, the Volcano style hot end, and the Ultrabase style glass bed, the Sidewinder X1's got a lot of style. It also has dual Z-axis stepper motors and lead screws, and those are synchronized with a belt around the back. Now that helps keep the X-axis aligned, preventing one side of it from getting higher than the other. Inside, it has a 24-volt power supply, an 8-bit control board with silent stepper drivers, and a color touchscreen LCD. It's running Marlin firmware, and the source code is available. Yay, open source! For conveniences, the Sidewinder X1 has a filament runout sensor, so it can tell you when it's time to run out and get more. And it features power loss recovery, allowing you to resume a print if there was a power failure. It also has an RGB LED mounted at the hot end, and during the warm-up before a print, it changes color to show status information. When you first start a print, it's blue because the hot end is cold, but as the hot end gets up to temperature, the color gradually shifts to red. Once everything is up to temperature and the printer starts laying down filament, it changes to white, or its best approximation of white, to light up the area around the nozzle. It does not have automatic mesh bed leveling, but it does have assisted bed leveling, where the LCD screen directs you to select each corner for leveling with a piece of paper as a feeler, as well as the center of the bed. Now you can select each leveling point as many times as you need until you get the bed leveled out. Now it does have a couple of interesting features. It uses these flat flex cables instead of the usual cable bundles that you tend to see on 3D printers. Now the flat flex cables give the printer a sleek professional look, but they've been an issue for some. Although I've not personally had a problem with the connections, others have. I've seen reports on Twitter showing burned or overheated traces on the end of the connectors, so although I haven't had this problem, just be aware that some have. That said, others report they've been using their side winders for nearly a year without a problem, but the inclusion of a spare set of flex cables is an indication that artillery is aware that they can be a point of failure. If you start to have any sort of issue with the extruder or the hot end or with the printer's ability to move left or right, basically anything on the x-axis, Check those cables and replace them if you need to. Another interesting feature on the Sidewinder is that instead of mechanical in-stop switches, it uses inductive sensors. And it can print from either its micro SD card slot or from a USB flash drive, such as the one that comes with the printer. And of course, there's a regular USB Type-B port on the side, so you can print directly from your computer or from a Raspberry Pi running Octoprint. So I wanted to come back to the design of the bed, because it's something I haven't seen before. Where other printers which have a glass print surface have a heated aluminum plate attached to the Y carriage and then the glass is clipped onto that plate, this glass bed has no aluminum plate. It has a heating element adhered directly to the underside of the glass. And because there's no underlying aluminum platform, the adjustment bolts are bonded directly to the glass as well. There's also a layer of insulation adhered to the heating element. So you've got the glass top, the heater underneath, and then the insulation. Now the insulation is some kind of foam, but it also has a layer of thick metal foil. And the edges of the foil can be sharp, so it's possible to cut your fingers on it, so be careful. Anyway, by eliminating the aluminum plate and attaching the heating element directly to the glass, the bed can get to 60 degrees C faster than the nozzle can get to 200 degrees C. It's pretty incredible. The printer can go from a cold stop to starting a print in about a minute. But there's a trade-off with this design. If you are used to being able to unclip the glass bed for faster cooling to remove a print, you won't be able to do that with the Sidewinder X1. Also, some people like printing on the smooth side of a glass instead of the textured side, and you can't do that either. So you're going to have to wait for the bed to cool to get it to release the print. So we've talked about some of the features and we've talked about the specs. Let's talk about usability now. The LCD touchscreen is bright and easy to read. For the most part, it's easy to figure out which buttons do what, but something that would be really nice to have in either a PDF manual or a paper manual is a diagram of the menu tree. A reference guide like that is invaluable when you're just starting out with this printer. It's much easier to look in the manual than poke around through the menus. Okay, so what else? 
Oh, the spool holder. It's a really nice one and it's got bearings for the spool to roll easily. But not all spools are created equal widthwise, and so when changing out a spool, you may need to adjust the distance between the two halves of the spool holder. And in order to do that, you need to grab the appropriate Allen key to loosen two bolts, securing one side of it, slide it to the correct width for the spool, and tighten the bolts again. And you have to do this from the back of the printer because that's where the bolts are. So that's a little bit inconvenient. I don't know if Artillery could redesign the spool holder so that the adjustment bolts were on the front instead of the back, and then use thumb screws instead of the bolts that they're currently using. Now that way you could loosen them, adjust the width, and tighten them again without needing tools. As long as we're talking about the spool holder, I wanted to point out that the filament sensor is on kind of a ball joint kind of thing, so it could swivel around as needed to accommodate the angle of the filament coming off the spool, or swivel to be more in line with the extruder on taller prints. Now the fans on the printer are astonishingly quiet, both at idle and when it's printing. In fact, the whole printer is really quiet. This is one of the few printers which, in its stock configuration, I can use at my desk and not really be distracted by the noise. Now earlier I mentioned the printer comes with a USB flash drive, and it's pretty convenient to be able to copy files to the flash drive from your computer, and then put that flash drive in the printer and start a print, instead of having to fiddle around with a tiny micro SD card. But the printer can handle both kinds of media, so if you do enjoy fiddling with tiny micro SD cards, the X1's got you covered. Sadly, I did have a, a weird failure where the printer just stopped in the middle of a print, like the nozzle in the bed stayed hot. Now the screen was still responsive, so I was able to cancel the print job, but uh, there was really no reason for it to have done that. Asking around, the general consensus was that the flash drive needed to be reformatted, so I backed it up and reformatted it, and it's been okay since then. One other issue I've had is that when I print files sliced with Prusa Slicer, sometimes the printer will skip part of the first layer. Like sometimes it skips part of the skirt, and one time it skipped part of the first perimeter. It was weird. Now I've adjusted the skirt to be three loops and three layers high, and the problem occurs a lot less often. As a bonus, having a 3x3 skirt makes them easy to get off the bed. I tested the power loss recovery feature, which worked as advertised, and I tested to make sure that thermal runaway protection was enabled, and it is. Also, I accidentally tested the filament runout sensor. I was printing a drawer organizer and thought I had enough filament. Turns out I didn't. I ran out about 75% of the way through. And the sidewinder let out a series of loud beeps to get my attention. Now, I had a little trouble getting the replacement spool loaded because I had to go find the right size Allen key to be able to adjust the spool holder to fit the spool that I was loading. And I needed to grab some tweezers to pick off the nozzle booger that started to form when I was loading the second filament into the extruder. But in the end, everything worked out okay, and I was able to resume the print. So speaking of prints, here are a few things that I've printed on the X1. Now this is a drawer organizer, and that's the one I was just talking about that I ran out of filament. It's just a grid with square holes in it. And it was supposed to be all IC3D black PLA, but, you know, ran out of filament, right? So I had to grab something quick, and what came to hand was my spool of filamentum luminous orange PLA. This stuff is like retina burningly bright. I'm also just about out of it, so I'm going to have to order some more. Now, I've printed very tall things as well. This base mode rocket plane was scaled to the maximum print height of 400 millimeters, so you can print something this tall, and I think it came out great. This was done in a rainbow PLA, the manufacturer of which I do not remember. My daughter likes to get it for me for Christmas and my birthday, so I've got a lot of rainbow PLA. Well, I've got less of it now after having used most of the spool to print Rob Paws's Mandalorian helmet in rainbow PLA, but I still have a lot. Now, I've printed a few other things as well. This wizard dice tower is printed in a CC3D rose silk PLA, and whoo boy is that shiny. It's like a super shiny fuchsia color. Now, it's a three-piece model, and it can take a while to print. I'm pretty sure that this represents about 24 hours or more of print time, but wow, is it nice. It's super detailed inside and out, and it's functional too. Drop a die in the top here, and it bounces down the stairs and pops out the door at the base of the tower. And this crow is a project that I'm hoping to have finished before Halloween. It'll have a battery pack and an Arduino Nano inside, and that'll control a servo and some LEDs in the head to swivel the head around and, and blink the eyes. And I've also printed small things like an XYZ calibration cube, a stringing test, a bridging test, and Luby's Aria Dragon. And all four of those are in the filamentum luminous orange. That may have been a mistake because I don't know how well that's going to video. They may be too bright. So the cube and the bridging test and the stringing test came out amazingly well. 
I did have a little issue with the base of Aria's left wing. The filament was kind of curling up a little, so that might be a cooling issue, or I may need to adjust the temperature a little bit for that filament profile in my slicer. And I printed a newer version of my Frisbee, uh, flying disc in TPU. Now this has a lot more material around the edges, so it's got more mass, and that helps it have a more stable flight. Now I was able to print this at 60 millimeters a second, thanks to that geared drive system. You might be able to see a few scuffs on it, and that's because my daughter wanted to play test it. Even though it's flexible, this is an outside toy, so we had to play outside and it got a little dirty. Now, I printed an earlier version of that disc in TPU on a stock Ender 3, which has a Bowden drive system, and I had to print it really slowly at about 20 millimeters a second. So having the direct drive on here really makes a difference in printing speed for TPU. So links for all of these things that I printed are down in the description. If you saw one you liked and you want to print it, go check them out. Well, link for everything but the drawer organizer and the flying disc. That flying disc is still a work in progress and may end up being the subject of a video. So, final thoughts. This is a large format printer in the same size class as the various Reality CR10 models, the Sunlu S8, and others. Printers at this size can sell from the mid $200 range to the high 500s and beyond. The retail cost of the Sidewinder X1 on Artillery's site is $499, but you can get it for less from other resellers. The dual Z-axis stepper motors are nice, as is the direct drive extruder, and that glass bed with the heating element directly attached to it heats up fast. Being able to go from zero to printing in about a minute will spoil you. Assembly is quick and easy, the manual is well illustrated, and enough information is provided to allow you to create a printer profile in the slicer software that you prefer. But I think it would be nice if, in addition to Repetier Host, Artillery included specific setup information for several slicers, such as Ultimaker's Cura, Prusa Slicer, and Raise 3D's Idea Maker. Now, apart from a few issues, needing to reformat the USB flash drive, that weirdness with skipping part of the skirt on a first layer, my concerns about the sharp edges on the bed insulation, and needing to grab tools to adjust the spool holder, those issues aside, I'm very, very impressed with the printer. It's quiet when it's in use. The only printer I have that's quieter in its stock configuration is my Prusa Mark III. Now, that one's kind of the gold standard for quiet, so for the Sidewinder X1 to be second quiet, that's saying something. So overall, I think it's a good printer, although first-time users may need a little bit of hand-holding to get going on the software side of things. At $4.99, the price is a little steep for a printer with an 8-bit control board, given the recent surge of printers with 32-bit boards on the market. Now, I've only been using it for about a month, so I haven't run into any hardware issues that would require warranty support, so I can't comment on how Artillery handles warranty claims. But I also haven't run into issues with the flex cables, but if I do, that'll probably end up being in a future video. So with that, I think I've covered everything. If you have any questions about the Sidewinder, be sure to leave a comment down below. Well, 3D printing friends, that's about all the time we have for this episode. So now that we're at the end, let's go print something cool. Hey, real quick before you go, I wanted to say thanks for being one of the super awesome people who sticks around all the way to the end, and thanks for all the likes, comments, and shares. And an especially big thanks to those who directly support what I do. You're all wonderful for doing that, and I really appreciate it. If you liked this episode, a thumbs up would be great, and if you'd like to help support the channel, check the description for ways that you can do exactly that. Oh, I've got some other videos here that you might want to take a look at, too. And if nothing else, please consider subscribing if you haven't already done so. It's absolutely free, and it's an excellent way to help keep me making these videos for you. Well, that's it for this one. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time here on the BV3D channel.